Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a while uh, since I did this. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transportation. I was in the United States for three weeks, and some of that was adjacent to a weekend in which I uh, could not be online for this. So uh, in the entire month of March, I did not stream, and now we're back. The topic for today is going to be an update about uh, my actual paid work. So this is not what I do for a living. Neither My blog is not really what I do for a living either. This is what I do for a living. It is called the Transit Costs Project. Um, we have an actual name at the research group, which is not the Transit Costs Project. I believe it's the Transit and Infrastructure uh, Research Group. And uh, what this is, is a, uh, so, so, the, so this user interface will just let you click on any city and see all of the subway lines, in the, or all of the metro lines, I should say, in the city that we have uh, data for, which is often very incomplete. Uh, we have a lot of, we have some lacunae in, lacunae in China, we have a bunch in Seoul, a bunch in Russia, where we're missing a lot of uh, Russia data. Uh, I tried finding Belarus data. The problem is that in Belarus, the quality of the media reporting on this is complete trash. Uh, I can try to show you one of the articles that I, that, that I saw about this that stated that, like, that stated the precise per kilometer cost for the Minsk metro, which is a cost that I'm even willing to believe, but I'm not willing to believe the article, and I could not find any independent reporting. Um, and it's not that Belarus is totalitarian, it is, but so is China. In China, I do believe official statistics on this, because it's a bunch of different sources, and it's much more technical, whereas it, whereas in Minsk, the, the Minsk Metro Extension course, the the writing style for, for the for the Piece, which is again the only source on this that I found. It's written like North Korean media, like, like our glorious leader uh, Alexander Lukashenko said something something. How is Indian data quality? Excellent. Um, we have some gaps in India, um, but not actually that many. The main thing in India is that the costs. I should not hover over Dhaka when I talk about India. Um, is that the costs, so in Mumbai, the costs are line by line. So this is, I think in almost, I think we're missing line one, but in Mumbai, we're basically complete other than that. It's just that often, so in cities that are not Mumbai, the way Indian metros work is uh, in phases and phases are multi-line. This is for the record also how Paris built the metro. Um, so let me show you some, Okay, another uh, strange thing that I don't know what to do about is that I randomly started getting ads um, in Firefox. Uh, I cannot tell whether Firefox is being shitty or I need a new ad blocker in addition to the account in one, two, three, four that I have. So um, there's going to be a map somewhere in this article. Maybe this one? Not this one. No, this is line by line. So, so there's a map that maybe it's in the French article that is about that, that shows you the early the uh, the, the early network uh, by when it opened. Yeah, this. Um, where's my head? On the left, not the right. Great. Uh, so, let's shrink my head a bit. Um, shrink. So, um, this is, I want to say the early network, but Paris Paris is on New York. New York has not built a single main line since 1940. Paris has built two because uh, line 13, the central segment, is from the 70s, and line 14 uh, is from the 90s and 2000s. But 
2000. It opened in 2000. No, it opened in 1999. Uh, but this is most of the network, and you can kind of see that it's a multi-line phasing thing. So uh, line one in the city, line two and six forming the ring, which at the time did not operate this way. Uh, the core of line five. Uh, the core um, li um, line three within the city as well, um, for the most part. Um, line four within the city. In fact, I, I believe line four st um, did not even extend to the suburbs until maybe the 2000s. Um, and uh, then shortly thereafter, uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, um, early line, uh, where's early line seven? Um, oh, line seven was not even, I, I thought line seven was like 1908 or something, I guess it's 19, 19 times. Um, uh, and also line 12, which is this one, is early from a competing company. So, Multi-line phases, and then the lines get extended. So phase one is, I guess, the green, and then you're starting to see more of the orange. Uh, then they kept extending with a combo of new lines. So this is what will become lines eight and nine, uh, but also extensions of the existing lines to the suburbs. Um, and I bring all this up because India, again, maybe except by builds matters this way as well. So um, the metro is in phases, where each phase is multiple lines, and then the phases add new lines, but also go farther into the suburban parts of the, of the cities. Um, and so um, our costs are often very coarse, maybe for an entire phase and not for segments of that phase. Bear in mind. Um, so in New York, this is all going to be recent stuff. I do have star costs in New York from the early 20th century, and those two I only have by phase. So I can tell you the cost of the first subway. I can tell you the cost of the dual contracts. I can tell you the cost of the IND. I cannot tell you the cost of individual components of the IND beyond very vague things. So um, I start with the New York City subway, for people who don't know, is, let me find this, uh, is that there were three three railroads in three phases, but they don't correspond. So the first phase is IRT. Second phase is dual contract, which is partly IRT, partly BMT. And the third phase is phase is IND. Um, if there's going to be a, a historic map, the historic maps generally show the different systems. Uh, but if I can't find one, then I will just show you um, an official or semi-official map. Uh, there has to be a history of the New York City subway. Yeah. Corona. Um, and uh, where? No, I don't want 97. I want things wrong. If you're not going to show me maps, I might just look at retro crayon for lack of okay. So this is retro crayon, by which I mean this was the crayon in the 1930s. So I need to tell you what exists and what doesn't. So blue on this map is IRT, of which the original subway is just originally from here, but then it got extended over here. So it's um like this. And then it runs like here. So, and this kind of got orphaned when they made it into two lines. So this is why it's a shuttle. Uh, and then you go up here and then it's this branch. I forgot whether all the way or only as far as the Northern tip of Manhattan, I think, or maybe around here. And then the second branch goes frip about here, which is where the line ends still. Like this is not in the... Um, and this going up until here. Dual contracts is the other blue and yellow lines that were actually built. Most of these were not. So um, this was never built, this yellow, but um, neither was this. But the yellow, blue, and queens, these have been built as far as pimp and shrimp. Uh, this, so it's 42nd Street. 
this part, this part. Um, Jerome was built. The line that exists was actually extended. Uh, this, and then this line. This segment used to exist, but they didn't run this way. They instead ran it like this way. So this thing is. Um, I think it was an orphan commuter rail and was never built. In Brooklyn, they go as far as here, not here. This segment is probably the second most important thing to build. I would say Second Avenue, this is the, this is the single most important and it's not been built. This has been built. Um, most of the yellow in Brooklyn um, is real, like, exists. And then, so the red lines are either things that were built in the third phase, so IND 1930s, or were planned and never built. And so Second Avenue Subway famously was never built. I mean, it was built later as like something like this. Uh, but 8th Avenue and 6th Avenue were built. 6th Avenue, my understanding was the big pain for how it was built. But again, I don't have costs per segment just for the entire Andy. So again, this is a data quality issue that we're not worried about. Um, because the main of the project is not to find the construction costs anymore, it's to uh, do the case studies. Um, we're not going to have a London report. We're going to have a report that is informed by London and by Paris um, and by Madrid and by Seoul and to some extent by Singapore and Toronto and Los Angeles as not very good cases. Uh, and we're also going to be informed by Nordic things that are not Stockholm, very little Berlin, unfortunately, and to some extent, um, as a negative example, unfortunately, the Netherlands. Let me not do maps of uh, the New York City subway anymore. Maybe I should also. Yes, so 6th Avenue was expensive partly because of the um, L, and by the way, um, you're spelling it as one letter because it's how it's spelled in Chicago, in New York, where they were nearly all turned down. It's spelled E-L. Um, like if you say the L like this in New York, this only means the L train. If you say L-E-L, -E then rail fans know what you mean. It means an elevated line. Um, and yes, it was because it was, uh, there was uh, not just, so not, not only was there a 6th Avenue L, uh, stop looking at you. Uh, not only was there an L on 6th Avenue, the old L's were 2nd, 3rd, 6th, and 9th. The subway that replaced 9th was not on 9th, but on 8th. So it was easier to build. The one that replaced 6th was under 6th. So that required underpinning and it was hard, but also paths. There was already a subway under 6th Avenue. There were plans to expand that subway and get it all the way to Grand Central. They just hugged it. So it was two tracks under 6th. So they built the local tracks flanking the subway on both sides without cross-platform transfers because the IND did not believe in connections to other people. And um, uh, later when they added the express tracks, they added them underneath, so you can't even go underneath uh, to try to connect this with Grand Central. And, okay, I'm going to not have Microsoft Teams. Path, yeah, exactly, path. I mean, at the time it was not called Path, it was called Hudson 2, but Path. So this was really expensive. Uh, but the entire IND was very expensive. Most of it was not 6th Avenue. 6th Avenue was only a little bit. The IND was also stuff like a subway under Queens Boulevard, which went... And they also widened the road at the same time. The road was not as wide when they, started, when they were planning the subway. And uh, even uh, and they built it underground and not elevated. But even for fully underground, the costs were pretty bad. Um, and they built lots of flying junctions that they didn't need to. Like, like, like I, I don't want to talk about the mistake that the IND made because historians of the subway have talked about them extensively. It's something that like everyone on Subjet, everyone on New York City Transit. And we see subway on your screen. And we see subway.org will be able to tell you um, in much more detail than I can. So 
again, I'm not talking about the past, I'm talking about the present, and the reason I'm talking about the present, not about the past, is uh, let's do GDP for a second, okay? So let's go World Bank. Um, I'm gonna do GDP per capita, and I'm gonna do Turkey and the United States. Turkey is the poorest country that we're doing a case in. Uh, it has very low construction costs, and it also has very low labor costs. So I would like to point people's attention to the fact that Turkey's GDP per capita uh, now, 28, I mean, it's much less than the United States. It's like half that of the United States. Um, and they, they also have, I think, lower, uh, I think they have lower employment to population. Like, my understanding is that the female labor force participation rate in Turkey is going to shift, but um, that's not going to matter um, too much when I'm saying, like, why it's low, it's just Turkey, America. But note that Turkey is not that much poorer than the United States was in 1990. And um, if they go on measuring worth and start doing historical comparisons, I think Turkey, compared with the United States, would have been probably somewhere in the 1970s. So, essentially, every comparison that's historic, that goes to an America before the 1970s, is going to be to a society that was poorer than Turkey is today. Um, and it's going to matter because poverty influences things like labor costs. Now, actually poor countries, again, Turkey is half the United States, not a poor country, okay? That's a poor rich country. An actually poor country, let's call it India, um, will generally have high costs because um, often what they do is they import first world methods and the first world methods that they import don't really make use of their advantage of low labor costs. Turkey does something different. So Turkey has extreme levels of cultural cringe, but it trusts its own construction industry. And um, they uh, did a lot of internal improvements to the system that they learned from Italy um, in the 2000s. So what they're doing in Turkey um, is much more appropriate for their level of development, whereas, for example, in Sweden, the labor costs are much higher. And in Sweden, they make much more of an effort to reduce um, headcounts because wages in Sweden are very high. The, so in New York the people who uh, dig tunnels for subways are called sand hogs. So in New York speak, everyone says sand hogs. Um, nobody in Europe that I've asked knows the term. And this includes people who speak very good English. In Sweden, they're not called sand hogs. In Sweden, they're just called miners. They are recruited from the same pool of workers as actual miners. This was also historically the case in uh, the United States. So the New York City Sandhogs of the early 20th century were often immigrants uh, from mining regions, like uh, maybe Welsh immigrants, I, I think were, were a big group, or maybe Irish. Uh, maybe um, I, I don't know if they had extensive mining within Ireland, but there was already 120 years ago a lot of Irish migrant uh, labor within Britain. Um, so, uh, so, so the, uh, did use people who had mining background, uh, as sand hogs. So in, so, so anyway, the miners in Stockholm, I don't know the exact wages that they make because I didn't find the wage rates. I only know what people told me and they gave me two conflicting numbers. One was 70,000. The other was 80,000. These are not dollars per year. These are kroner per month, uh, before tax. And uh, the krona is about nine to the dollar, maybe eight to the dollar. Um, I think at PPP it's more like nine. So add a little bit to turn it into dollars a year. These are people who earn a very nice weight. Um, and that's fine. I mean, it's very difficult work. Like, you know, I'm not complaining that they earn something like $90,000 a year before tax. Probably their cost to so probably their existence costs the employer I don't know, 150, 180 thousand US dollars a year um, with benefits, with um, temporary housing. Important in Sweden, as in the other countries where we're doing cases, uh, the miners uh, are not local. 
there, it's a national mobile workforce. It's also true of, for example, railway maintenance. So in Spain, the railway maintenance is a national labor force that moves between between cities. So they have to pay them extra because it's annoying to constantly move, and also they have to give them temporary housing. So um, the so there's temporary construction worker housing or maintenance worker housing that is being set up when they do maintenance in in Valencia or in uh, or in Zaragoza or in uh, or, or in Alicante or in Madrid, and so and it's the same thing in uh, Sweden. In fact, I read an article that said that not a single miner building the current extension of the Stockholm metro lives permanently in or around Stockholm. They're all domestic, maybe inter- um, maybe some international migrants. Um, I bring this up because. Um, Again, again, it's adaptations to levels of development, and the point is that in the United States, even if you go to the 1950s and 60s, let alone the 1920s and 30s, you will find a profoundly different society, um, where, for example, labor costs were much lower. Now, we might talk about how Americans use methods and especially social organization that assumes 1950s, 60s labor costs, um, but the failure to adjust in the intervening 60 years means something. Um, and um, so this is where we're doing contemporary comparisons in a historic. And uh, so anyway, this is where we're at. Um, we're doing, as I said, cases where it was supposed to be six reports. It's going to be five reports, which are Boston, uh um, which is the one that's already out. There's Istanbul and Mil- uh, not Milan, all of northern and central Italy, really. Uh, both of them are, effect- are effectively done. So the Italian case is in li- is um, Eric doing line edits for Marco. The Turkish case is I did the line edits for Elif. And um, I believe when I looked at it a week ago, what I not even work well, less than a week ago. Uh, I saw. I think I made. Ten, I think I made ten edits and a document of a hundred pages. Uh, and uh, I don't know if she's already done all edits or only the biggest because I, I get notifications and I shared Google if I if I make a comment and it's resolved. So the Turkish case is effectively done. The Italian case is um, also effectively done. Uh, we're at this point nitpicking things like, uh, do we consistently write words with or without accents? Um, and we're going to do with, because for example, in Turkey, you can say that there's a neighborhood of Istanbul called Kadikoy, but it's not Kadikoy, it's Kadikoy. Um, so putting, so like writing the dotless I and the umlauted O, so, ka, so Kadikoy, not, not Kadikoy, Kadikoy. It's hard for me to pronounce. In my defense, Turkish the, the Turkish language understands that it's hard to pronounce. They have vowel harmony. Kadık um, violates a vowel harmony because it's a it's a compound. Whereas normally um, in in a bunch of languages, it's uh, I think in definitely in Turkish. I think it's all, in all of the Turkic languages, all of the Mongolic languages. I think maybe all the Tungusic languages. Also in Finnish, they have something called vowel harmony, where um, uh, it's not in compound though. So, but in suffixes, if a word has umlauted vowel, if a word has umlauted vowels, uh, then all of its vowels will be umlauted, and the suffixes will also be umlauted. Uh, and if a word has n- vowels that can take umlaut but are not umlauted, then all of the vowels will have no umlaut, and the suffixes will be unumlauted. So, like um, the plural in Turkish, it's either uh, lar or ler. Um, um, non umlauted, umlauted. Um, but again, it's on comments. Right? So anyway, my point is that I know I'm mispronouncing Kadukoy, and as I said, even by Turkish standards, it's supposed to be a hard word to pronounce at least. So anyway, writing the so when uh so we're we're this is not Kadukoy by the way, this is Karakoy, no, different name. Uh. And so, essentially, these are done. They will be out this month. There's the 
Sweden case, which is what I'm writing, which will not be 100 pages, and will also be out at the end of this month. Uh, it's based on fewer interviews, but a lot of public data. Sweden has very good public data on a lot of things. So, for example, I've found a link to every contract involved in the Metro expansion in Stockholm because they're just going to put them because it's transparent and it's not dickhead transparency. So in America and in Britain, there's this concept that I'm sure it exists by a serious name in the organizational literature or in the political science literature. I'm just going to call it dickhead transparency where um, if you if you guys have seen Yes Minister and I do not know if the Borner, it, it, not the Borner, just Borner is, is watching, I, I know that you have. Everyone else, it's it's a television show that was Margaret Thatcher's favorite television show. She wrote fanfic. The people who made the show were sufficiently Tory that they even uh, let they, they even literally produced like the one scene fanfic that Maggie wrote. It's a television show about how the civil service runs the country and are all ignorant idiots. Um, I mean, very officious ones, but still very ignorant. But um, it's very public choice theory, and uh, but like it gets the contempt that the, that the senior civil servants have for the general public in Britain. Really, and the, the point is that at one point the minister asks them for more to uh, tell the, to tell him what they're doing, so they give him red boxes of documents to review, and like they're all completely meaningless. Like they he asks for more information, so they give him a document to review with stationary acquisition. Um, so. That's the dick of transparency. Like you ask for, like you do a, um, you do a freedom of information request. So first of all, the data is not already available in the Australia. Okay, you need to affirmatively request it, and they can say no or they can redact. Um, in New York, for example, there are itemized costs for everything. So New York does something called a lump sum contract, uh, which is the bad way of doing infrastructure. The good way is to itemize the contract. So um, the Contractor says we're going to do X widgets and Y gadgets. Widgets currently cost X. Gadgets cost. Oh, I always said X Y. Widgets currently cost A. Gadgets cost B. So it's going to be X times A plus B times plus Y times B. That's our uh, plus A profit rate. That is uh, that is our bid. Uh, if these are commodities that have changing international rates, then Sure. Yeah, there's a cost overrun, but you already know. I mean, that's. I mean, they said X widgets and Y gadgets. If the costs have changed, we know the costs have changed. It's not contagious. In New York, they do lump sum. Uh, there, they have internal reasons for why they're doing lump sum, but the fundamental reason they're doing lump sum is that they don't listen to how people who don't speak English do it. They do not even believe that they have a construction cost crisis in, in New York. They are certain there must be something. Um, it's not possible that they're just doing a worse job than Italians and Spaniards and Swedes and Koreans and Turks. Um, or, for that matter, literally anyone else. But these are the lower cost places, not the medium cost places. So in, uh, so, so in New York, they do the, these lump sum contracts. And, uh, and again, in low cost countries, it's itemized, and um, so, so this is like one of the things that we've noticed, uh, and so, um, so so the report is gonna so we're gonna put that into the report. We're gonna put um, we're gonna put um, kind of best practices in the report after the five reports that we write, and uh, and then we're gonna. Um, and then we're going to do a summary. And, and the point that I'm making with transparency is that in New York, first of all, again, you have to request information. Often the information exists, but it's either hidden by security through obscurity, hence the sort of information process, or they will just not tell you. So in New York, they have itemized costs for everything. They just don't release them because they are only used for internal cost estimates. And if they release them, then they say that, it is, that these are trade secrets. So in New York, they will just not tell you what the what what the breakdown of the costs is. Um, and uh, and in Sweden, 
not only will they let you know, but also it's a, it's presented in a format that's very digestible, so I can see a big contract and what cost. So a contract to build a certain tunnel segment, or a contract to do ventilation, a contract to build a station, maybe two stations. It's it's item. It's not just broken down, but it's broken down at a level that's very useful for watchdog, uh, for, for example, for watchdog organizations, uh, for researchers, uh, because in Sweden the government works for the public. Now the public can be morons, but the government works for the public. And so, yeah, the government needs to report to the public in a format that the public, um, in a format that the public can understand, uh, which doesn't mean like only using you know the thousand most common words in the Swedish language or any bullshit like that. But it does mean uh, not not doing what New York just did. So um, New York is currently facing demands for uh, something called platform screen doors, and they have made up reasons why a platform screen door would cost something like seventy million dollars or something like that per station uh, in Paris. It's Four million euros. This is a platform screen door. Um, sometimes there's a distinction between screen door, which goes all the way up, and edge door, which is only usually uh, this high. Usually, new installations tend to be. Uh, like, like, sorry. Let me clarify when I say new. If it's if you're building it with the station, it's almost always like this. And if you're building this after you've built the station and operated without these doors, then it's usually like this. Um, there may be exceptions to what I just said. I can't think of that. But I only know like you know, ten examples. I don't know five hundred. Um, so uh, this, for example, would be a full height a, uh, on on the city metro. Uh, this is. I mean, it's in an elevated line. So okay, it's just showing you right. I, do they have Singapore? Yeah, so in uh, Singapore, it's uh, of the elevated stations. These are new installations, so they're either platform edgers or half high. The point is, in New York, uh, they don't have these. Uh, there was a very well publicized. Oh, so, Taipei, so in Taipei, it's all retrofitted because in Taipei, it's. Wait, in Taipei, it's. I don't think it's all high. In Taipei, it's, I think. I think in Taipei on the MRT it's half high. Um, it's full height on the uh, on the airport train. But anyway, so in New York there was a, a very well publicized case in which um, someone pushed someone else onto the tracks, uh, was in headway train and died. And and so there were calls for platform screen doors on the subway in New York. And the MTA made up reasons why it would cost, why it's often impossible, and when it is possible, it's going to cost many tens of millions per station. Again, in Paris, they're doing that as we speak, four million euros a pop. And yes, the stations are shorter, but they're not ten times shorter. They're ninety meters in New York. They're between one hundred fifty and one hundred eighty. Um, and so the. Uh, and, and so the journalists were asking for like more details about why it would cost so much. So the MTA sent them a three. I forget whether a three thousand or a four thousand page document. But I mean, you can't like nobody reads three thousand to four thousand page documents, right? I mean, these exist maybe for the archives. Um, like these documents were not created for the benefit of the public, is my point. And at no point was anyone thinking about writing documents that the public could read and review. Um, and at no point it's like at, the, at a readable level, let's call it the 50-page level that explains maybe a few representative stations, which is something that I saw about, not platform screen doors, but about station construction for uh, Grand Paris Express. Uh, I think I saw something with three representative stations uh, that goes into more detail and then explains more briefly the rest. So in, so, so the 3,000 to 4,000 page example is dickhead transparency. Um, is it transparent? In theory, yes. In practice, well, no. Um, 
And again, in Sweden, they're very good about actual transparency. In Italy, by the way, they're good about transparency as well. There's a lot of stereotyping of Italian corruption. Um, but in infrastructure, actually, Italy is very clean. Um, and my understanding is that Italy is also getting better at uh, tax issues. So, so in Italy, uh, there's a lot of tax avoidance among uh, uh, among business owners. So uh, if you have a family scale business, you don't really pay taxes. And this makes it hard for businesses to scale up. Um, and in Italy, they understand the problems that Italy has. And so they are uh, starting to crack down. Um, I want to say that like in the last few years, Italy has not had worse tax evasion than the United States. It's distributed differently. So in Italy, it's specific to small business. I think in the US, it's the rich in general. But again, Italy is a lot of the things that Italy is negatively stereotyped for, it understands and is getting better on. Um, and like there is a, a thing to say for like having enough humility to understand where you're screwing up and that other countries might be doing something better than you and you should emulate them and fix things, which is something that Southern Europe constantly does. Southern Europe constantly self flagellates Turkey even more. Um, the Nordic countries are very proud of themselves. Um, and we saw and we saw what it led to with Sweden and Corona. Um, so if they fuck up, it's uncorrected, especially if it's pan Nordic, which is really fucking bizarre. I mean, the other Nordics are seeing what happened in Sweden with Corona and know never to do that again. Sweden is too proud to to ever do an error, but the other Nordics understand. Um, now, thankfully, the subway construction costs throughout uh, the Nordic. Uh, states, uh, they're rather low. Um, like, I, I don't know if they constantly course corrected relative to Germany or something, if, if they just never needed to, but um, but it is a difference. Uh, and yeah, Ukraine, yeah, Ukraine is also a really good example. Like, Ukraine understands exactly what it means. Um, and um, there, there's this kind of thing where sometimes Ukraine understands what, like, being like a modern state with modern values means better than countries that don't actually have that debate because um, remember how Zelensky literally had that video when he was talking where he was correcting himself about generic he and said he she they um, and what and switch to singular they and because because he understands like how modern feminist and not homophobic societies work because he is from a society where um, first of all, that's a very recent thing, and second of all, um, like it's literally like for him, Western European soft tower versus Russian soft tower, um, and that's just a random example. And this is something that, and it's, it's not Chinese European; it's Ukraine, right? I mean, so Russian queers tell me horror stories about Russia. Polish queers tell me horror stories about Poland. I've never heard such a horror story about Ukraine from Ukrainian queers, and. And yeah, the, and, and I mean, Ukraine is poor, but Ukraine knows that it's poor. Ukraine is militarily not very strong compared with, let's say, the United States or Russia or France, but it understands that, so it actually managed to do reforms to actually do what it needs to beat Russia. And I mean, at this point, despite starting with not much, as, with like a giant manpower deficit versus Russia and with an income deficit, um, they're actually doing okay in the, in the war at this point. Um, again, precisely because they know that they need to emulate NATO standards. Uh, and at least at this point, I haven't seen the American blob take the lessons of Ukraine to heart with uh, respect to other things. So for example, where Ukraine is trying to fight Russia symmetrically, whereas the American blob wanted them to be insurgents. So the American blob did not think Ukraine could hold. They thought that Kiev would fall... Um, would fall within a few days, uh, and Ukraine should instead organize um, an asymmetric insurgency. Um, and the Americans essentially are saying the exact same thing to Taiwan. And now that Ukraine is beating back Russia symmetrically, I haven't seen the American blob actually show any more humility on the subject, unfortunately. Um, and so, so this is an example of how, like, the periphery can often course correct better than the core. I mean, the periphery is still periphery. Like, I mean, things that make it, Italy poor by North, their European standards, they're still there. I mean, Italy is still a country that's 
I'm forgetting the exact numbers. I want to say that two thirds of Italy, or maybe three quarters of Italy, work for small and medium sized businesses. And in the United States and in Scandinavia, it's flipped. So three quarters work for big businesses. Um, so it takes time for you know innovative businesses in, in the case of what Italy needs to grow and start having enough productivity and just start hiring away all the workers from the family scale businesses um, and offer higher wages and then those businesses are going to go bankrupt and release more labor to um, innovative big businesses. But again, but the Italians understand what they need to do. Um, and again, Ukraine is another really good example, as you're saying, Borners. And, um, and I don't know if we're going to go with that meta in the report, but we're definitely talking about how Turkey learned from other people, or how Italy learned from other people. Again, Sweden much less so. Sweden is very insular. Um, and um, so, anyway, th so anyway, that's the my transparency spiel. Um, so the, the point is that the data quality, the public data quality in Sweden is very good. Um, and that compensates for the smaller number of interviews. And, uh, and there's always um, comparisons one can make with how things work in Norway and Finland and Denmark. It's important because if Sweden does something very different from Norway and Finland and Denmark, but the outcomes are the same, then maybe that thing is not very important. Now, sometimes the outcomes are very different and it's notable. So for example, with Corona, we know what the excess death rates are in various countries. We know that within Europe through, I, I don't know through today, last check, um, 2020 and 2021, I believe is when I last checked, so through the end of 2021. And in Europe, the three countries with the lowest excess death rates are by a pretty big margin, or a pretty big, by a pretty big margin versus the fourth lowest, I don't remember which one that is, um, are Norway and uh, Finland and Denmark. Um, and I'm excluding Iceland from this, just because Iceland is very small, so there's a lot of noise in access stuff data. Um, and when the numbers are um, low enough, it's really difficult to um, to tease it out. But Sweden is not the fourth lowest. Sweden did worse than Germany. Um, I think Sweden did about as well as France. And in France, the country is poor. People live in much more overcrowded situations. Um, people stay with their parents longer than they do uh, in the Nordic countries. The Nordic countries are very individualistic this way. You leave at age 18. Um, France and Germany, it's more common to stay with parents into, the, into your 20s. And in Southern Europe, they're so poor that the majority of people um, age 18 to 34 live with their parents. So uh, much more household crowding. So much more corona rates, but relative to the countries, so, so, so my point is that Sweden did really poorly, but things did well because, great, they had fewer deaths than overcrowded countries. Countries that, like Sweden have low crowding rates, um, that is to say Norway, Finland, and Denmark, they did not do what Sweden did with corona, um, had negligible access deaths in the first wave. Um, and I don't even know if they would have seeded a second wave on their own or if it's something that... I mean, I imagine they would have because um, the, the second wave, is my understanding, in North, came to Northern Europe from vacationers because, because remember in summer 2020, everyone thought in Europe that corona was over, so people started flying to the Canary Islands. Um, and it's not, that, it's not like Spain was accessible at that point, but resorts are accessible. Um, people are very... People, like, like, the, like the resort behavior is very antisocial when it comes to public health. So, for example, um, people get very loud at pubs. Um, there was also a thing with the ski resort. Uh, Ishka, the one that seeded a lot of the first wave in southern Germany. Um, so, um, but, but, but I don't, but, but it's entirely possible that, like, with generic European practice and Nordic crowding rates, Corona would not have had as serious subsequent rates. Um, and so, so, so it's, so it's important to do these comparisons and see whether they track. Um, a big one is that I believe Copenhagen actually did design build. So Copenhagen built the metro later than the other three non-Iceland 
I guess non archaic nor the capitals, um, and they have higher costs. Now they do have different soil to some extent. They don't have nice, but Oslo is not fully nice either. And um, the um, and, and they're doing it in completely different ways. So very small uh, stations with uh, automated trains for very high capacity or very high frequency rather, leading to enough capacity. It's the same thing that Italy is doing. But their costs are again higher than in Sweden and in Norway and in Finland, and um, and it's also true, for example, their electrification project. And I suspect it's just that they're doing things. Maybe they're more connected with Britain. Maybe they're uh, maybe they're what's it called? Maybe maybe they just started more recently, so they uh, um, looked at what they thought was global practice, but. They're Nordic, so for them, global practice is stuff that's either Nordic or speaks English, and maybe they went with English-speaking practices. Um, but the but but the outcomes in in Copenhagen are visibly worse than in uh, than in Oslo and Stockholm and uh, and Helsinki. And uh, so 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 that is worth talking about, um, and that's going to at least some extent appear in the report. So. Again, so that's a Stockholm report. Um, I mentioned Italy and Turkey before. There's Boston, which is out. New York, and, and then there's going to be New York, which is going to be the last one because we need to um, have certain internal reviews for it. But um, that's going to appear later this year. Um, but essentially, we're going to be done with the draft at the end of this month. And, uh, and again, we're just going to essentially talk about what went wrong. And there's a lot of things in New York that went wrong. The um, procurement, uh, the agency turf battles with the utilities, um, the construction techniques, um, the way they implement the construction techniques, like the, dig, the station digs in New York are oversized, even relative to the methods that they're using. Um, uh, their labor situation is horrific, and it's Terrible for blue, and it's terrible with how low the efficiency of blue collar labor is in New York. But the efficiency of white collar labor in New York is even worse. Like between labor and management in New York, you should side with the immigrants who are going to replace both of them and offer them uh, cleaning jobs. Um, both of, both both of the groups are going to get, are going to be offered cleaning jobs. Like this is literally how um, terrible this is. Um, and it's hard and it's hard to tease out because if you talk to white collar people in New York, I mean, the, the labor relations are so toxic that the white collar people will blame everything on the workers. And again, a lot of things are the workers' fault. The Sandhawk Union in New York needs to be busted. Um, I don't think there, there's an alternative to that, which is fine. I mean, these people are earning a lot of money. I mean, will they find will they ever find a job that earns them as much money as they do? No, they won't. But they're rich. They can have savings. That's fine. Um, and they're not going to be poor. They're just going to have normal menial working class income, which is not the very high the not right, the middle six figures are there. Um and um but again the but a lot of it is white collar stuff and uh and a lot of the quotes you're seeing about labor overstaffing, they're real. But a lot of it is a, every agency um and every group wanting its own supervisor in the tunnel rather than just that. Um so, if you want to know what New York is doing wrong, the answer is everything, and we're going to talk about this in the report. Um, so, this is the state of the transit bus project. Um, is it possible that we're going to do more reports? The answer is yes, but it's not currently the plan. So, we have money to hire more people, and if other things turn out to not require as much headcount as we as we think, and yeah, we could pay people to write a Berlin report, a uh, Seoul report, actually, is uh, something we would really like to do, just because Seoul, I presume, is going to look very different from Southern Europe, but it's similarly cheap. Uh, maybe a Tokyo report, a Taipei report, um, a, uh, maybe a Warsaw report, um, not sure, Madrid report. Um, so could we do this part? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we have the budget um, to do a few more, but 
that's UET. This one, or am I just completely drunk? Oh, oh, okay, okay, sorry. I thought this was a specific foundation. No, we haven't talked to a Korean international. We've talked to people who have lived and worked in Korea. Um, um, like, it's not going to be a report that we're going to write ourselves. Like, we don't have the ties with Korea to do it, but we do have the ability to pay someone who will do that, um, which is essentially what we did with Turkey, um, except that... Not quite because we hired Elif full time because Elif is doing a bunch of other things very well as well. Um, like the website, for example, is her, or like the, the data phase is her. Um, um, a lot of the extra data entry is her. Like a lot, um, uh, a lot of the connections with uh, people doing things in Northern Europe and not just Turkey are her. So she's doing the Turkey report plus a lot more, which is why she's full time. In Korea, maybe. Um, it's something that we might do again. I don't think it's likely. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to other things um, in this topic, which can be... So first of all, we're going to just use the insights that we've learned to speak about ongoing projects. For example, I think Second Avenue Subway Phase 2 is too far advanced for us to be able to say, okay, here's how you're going to do it for 600 million instead of 6 billion. Huh, okay. Because... Swedish government agencies love thinking they're awesome, but they don't... Yeah, so this is... Right, so the court, this is what I'm going to get into. Um, so one of the things we're going to do is talk is use this to, like, have... To, to, like, be able to talk about how to do IBX better. The IBX is the new term for Tribro because they dropped the Bronx from it. So Tribro, I don't think I have New York Crayon on me. Um, so I'm just going to show you like this and maybe shrink my head, not lose my head, shrink my head, click on the square. Okay. So in New York, the subway is predominantly radial toward Manhattan. There is one circumferential line called the G, which misses most of the radial connections and is therefore useless. Um, and even for direct trips, the frequency sucks, and they're not making any effort to improve it. So these, so black means lines that exist. Some of them are sub. Um, I don't. I don't think they're depicting the subway line. I think in New York, the lines are for either main lines or elevated lines. So um, this is a subway line that's elevated, but they're only showing the elevated parts, not the underground parts. And, uh, anyway, so. This is not a subway. This is a disused freight branch, which at this point has, I believe, two trains in each direction in each day. Uh, it's called the Bay Ridge Branch, and there are fantasies about building a freight tunnel under the harbor like this and connecting it to this line. Uh, these are vaporware. Uh, but anyway, so there's this line. So it goes like this. Uh, and here it starts connecting to LRR lines. That, so this is the Montauk, the lower Montauk line, which has very little traffic. I don't know how much freight it has. It has, I want to say, one passenger train a day in each direction. There are plans to add more. Um, but um, then, um, then there's, or you can continue direct on the line. And uh, there's supposed to be two tracks. It's been it's been single track, but there's infrastructure to go back to two. Uh, and go all the way into the Bronx, and the current infrastructure leads you to the Northeast Corridor. Um, and there have been plans to use this for subway service. So the original plan for the 90s was to use existing, mostly existing tunnels to go um, not on the Northeast Corridor, but to go uh, to to, uh, to go with extent through extent but disused tunnel up until here, and then build a short greenfield tunnel to Yankee Stadium, and then zap the freight, which was, again, very few trains, uh, and build a circumferential subway. Uh, then people realized, oh, the freight is important, but we're still 
but it's only half a half of our trains a day. So let's do it commuter rail. We've heard about this thing called the overground, and we have never heard of any other kind of uh, um, urban commuter rail because we're Americans and we barely acknowledge the existence of London, let alone Paris. Uh, and they've made a plan to instead do a weird tangential that goes with the Northeast Corridor and the networks. This was also called Triborough. And uh, the new governor changes something called Interborough, which only goes as far as uh, here for the subway connection. Because this segment is kind of annoying uh, to deal with. And so, anyway, this is called Interborough Express, this plan. And so, for example, we're doing, we're already writing about. Oh, all the trains. Uh, oh, all the trains to uh, Long Island um, go further than mainland. I thought they had like one pair of trains on Lower Montauk, but maybe not anymore. Okay, I see what they're doing. So the link doesn't come direct from my computer. You see, the link comes from. Uh, like the hidden chat box thing that happens because of um, weird things coming from an o from OBS, so I need to copy paste. But anyway, yeah, this is it's that crayon, uh, which I called Nordic, but at this point I'm more comfortable saying Southern European, just because I understand it better than Sweden, which is weird in a bunch of ways. I understand Sweden better in a, in, in a month, but. Um, we're still not done with that, unfortunately. Um, and so anyway, yeah, this is, so the pink line is like essentially the old Triborough. Um, they varied a bit because they failed in one of the tunnels. But, um, and this point's going to be only up, up until here. It's called the Interbar Express. And we're talking about things. Um, so, so we wrote something about land use along the line. There's a lot of very low density land use that can be upzoned. Um, and uh, there's, uh, we could talk about things like how to not build elevated segments on top of this, but to actually share the right of way with the mainline trains, which again is only a handful a day, so they could go at 11 at night between subway trains that run every 10 minutes, and then they can still do maintenance overnight. And um, so, so it's things like this. And so essentially, being able to like work respond to things, it's one of the things we're going to do. The other, and, but the big thing is, as uh, as you said, it's going to be the high speed rail project, which is going to be somewhat analytic in the sense that we are going to do some comparisons, but it's going to be much less case studies because a lot because the case studies have already been written. I mean, there's a lot of there's actually a lot more research about high speed rail, including comparative research, than about subways. Cost comparisons um, exist for many sources, so it's not just that I need to. Uh, go to the media or, or go to planning docs and see the cost of every line because there are also places that will already do these comparisons between countries and yes, I will defend my database's usefulness, I will defend our database's um, completeness versus others, but other databases exist and there are case studies and, there, and that includes academic work on what's wrong. So for example, the Italian researcher Paolo Beria um, who was one of our sources for the Italian case, uh, he wrote a paper about the origin of uh, high-speed uh, high rail costs in Italy. In, in Italy, the, well, the, uh, so this is what you want to look at. Um, so uh, the... Uh, so the importance is that uh, the so so questions like this have already been studied. Um, by the way, I said this before. Um, Spain has very low construction costs throughout, uh, but Italy has low subway and high high speed rail construction costs. Uh, essentially, they're building high speed rail wrong. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to link to. We're, we're going to reference Baria, but the analytic work because it's mostly been done. Is not going to be as extensive, and it's much it's much more synthetic work. So, essentially, red teaming. Essentially, we're going to red team. What's it called? The Northeast Carter Commission. I think it's what it's called. 
and just because its plan is essentially a staple job, I, you go to every agency in the Northeast, including Amtrak, you say, you ask, what do you need? They say, we want this thing to get us uh, to not have to interact with the other agencies. And then you say, great. And then you take all of the wish lists and you staple them together. Hence, staple job, as opposed to actually sitting down with timetables and any kind of modern timetabling methods and figuring out how faster and slower trains can share the tracks better. Uh, like it's very much a concrete before electronics situation. These are also stable jobs, like the American Civil Service, like specifically the legal definition of civil service in the United States is you can't be fired. Um, yeah, no, it's like, like I, I keep saying that they should hire more engineers and people are staring at me, but we can't hire civil service because you can't fire civil servants. And like, it, it gets to the point that like, if I say things like, you know, you should maybe treat civil servants like professionals who are allowed to fail as opposed to a sinecure. And people again stare at me like I just proposed to... Uh, uh, set on fire the original copy of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence uh, and uh, restore the British monarchy. Um, and for the benefit of uh, all the um, random right-wing reactionaries who might think it's a good idea, the uh, uh, monarch, uh, the, the monarchs are going to run the United States in the Queen's name uh, are going to be um, Prince Harry and I don't know if she's literally Princess Megan or if she never accepted the title, but you know who I'm talking about. Uh, no, it's not about shovel-ready stuff. It's not about shovel-ready stuff. Actually, a lot of it is stuff that's highly speculative and highly shovel-unready. Things like random tunnels that are not necessary just because someone can point. So it's a good example of what needs to happen. So this segment of the Northeast Corridor, it's between New Haven and the Rhode Island state line, is the curviest. Now, it's not the slowest, the slowest is between New York and New Haven because it has, in addition to um, annoying curves, uh, annoying agency turf issues with Metro North and very poor uh, maintenance practices, which are also very expensive in addition to being very poor. Um, and, uh, and, and and so uh, the speeds east of New Haven are higher. Essentially, they run the trains better there. Or more precisely, they run fewer trains. So even though Amtrak does not know how to run trains. It does have priority on the segment, but this is a very curvy segment, and this is the less curvy part of it. Um, so you could just we could we could just trace the line, and here the worst curves start. You can see already how these are um, very tight, uh, and they're not just tight; they're tight and long tight, as opposed to like a quick tight curve between straight segments and flat terrain that you can very easily fix. No, these are hard to fix. Um, and New London is basically unfixable. Um, and, and it continues. And essentially, it only really gets better once you cross into Rhode Island. So Westerly is kind of bad. Um, this segment is not as bad. This is meh. And now, and then once you get to this point, that's when the racetrack starts. So the racetrack is... This is a very high-speed curve. And this is the fastest segment of the Northeast Corridor. So you want to use this, but not the slow part. So what you need to do is maybe do this and then go on a bypass. Uh, which I already drew. And then use I-95, which in this part of Connecticut is very straight. Um, you do need some deviations, but not very extensive ones. And you can avoid residential impacts for the most part. So this is what needs to happen. Now, the consultants, and I never remember which firm, I want to say ACOM, that did one of the reports, they're not stupid. I mean, they're, the senior ones are venal, but they understand that, so they actually wrote this bit. But first of all, they descoped this part because they thought that it is less curvy, so they were going to only start from Old Saybrook. But more importantly, people in Old Lyme yelled at them over community impact, some of which was real, some of which was fake. So instead of reducing community impact, 
to the minimum that is required and, for, and then for the rest of them to get better hobbies than sailing. Um, they proposed the tunnel. The tunnel is not shovel ready. The tunnel is just speculative. It's vaporware. Um, this is, I think, planned as a tunnel as well, which is also vaporware. I'm not sure. Even a bridge would be not shovel ready. So it's not like anything of this is... Uh, so it's not like shovel ready. Yeah, uh, yeah, neither wants to use the title anymore. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, you offer Harry the opportunity to be like king of the United States, he will take it. Uh, he can even uh, dress up as a Nazi again. Uh, maximum offense to Americans. But anyway, um, the point is that like, this is not too far off, like, the, the crayon from what has been proposed by serious people. It's just that those serious people proposed it with, like, little detail changes that are very expensive, like, again, random tunnels that are not necessary. Um, so we're going to propose it clean, I mean, without tunnels. Um, we're going to talk about um, how to share tracks better. So here, it's, so here the issue is NIMBYs, but again, it's not like they tried to fight the NIMBYs and they lost. They, don't, they didn't try because they don't care. The point is to get more money. Uh, they, 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 it's people who measure their success by how much money they've managed to get out of the federal government. You get the money regardless of whether it's cost-effective. Cost-effective is not going to create more money for high-speed rail except in the very long run, and these people are all boomers in the very long run, by which I mean in 15 years, they're, like, either suffering from severe dementia or dead, or they just live in Florida and don't care. Um, and so, because these people don't think in the long term, they just think about maximizing money now, and so it impor is important to them, I think, to avoid even the appearance of political controversy. Um, and they got a lot of money from the BIF. I mean, it's just that by themselves, you're just going to waste it all. So the plan is, again, to propose things where here it's counter and MB. Between, um, here the line doesn't really need a lot of work. Here the line needs more work, but actually very little. It's just a matter of electronics before concrete, a phrase that these people do not, under do not know or don't understand. Um, so essentially, that's what we're doing. He's king. He doesn't... People... You don't vote for kings. Do we need to go on YouTube and uh, dig for the uh, Monty Python thing? Um, for, for, for the Monty Python uh, and, and the Holy Grail Scott? Uh... But yeah, no. As I said, the bring yeah the torture constitution bring King Harry is just intended as maximum offense or something. And unfortunately, the idea that civil servants are uh, um, can be dismissed on essentially the same process as the private sector sounds to Americans as roughly the equivalent of that. Sadly. Um, no, I, I understand the joke is about the GOP liking Nazis. That's the point. So you let him do the SA uniform, but also have his black wife because that'll piss off everyone. Um, like, remember, the uh, alt-right in America started loving the British monarchy roughly, not for roughly, exactly timed for when uh, Harry started complaining that the British media was racist toward his wife. Um, and then when they, uh, semi-quit. No, Juan Carlos was a, was a consensus figure, no. Anyway, um, so the point is, yeah, we're going to talk about high-speed rail, and this is going to be a synthetic proposal. It's going to be, I don't know if it's going to look exactly like this. We're going to do much more serious analysis including a lot of alternatives, for example. Um, I mean, it's possible we're going to do some red... Again, I mean, say we're, we should red team, but I think of us as the red team, so like maybe we should red team ourselves or something and like try to look at what's the optimum for going to Hartford, because I think that this is 
a useful counterfactual. Like I think that the root Adra is better than going through Hartford, but despite the large, even though even not like this zoom, you can tell that this goes like this, and Hartford goes like this. Um, even though it's visible in very um, zoomed out maps, um, it's a decision that is not, it's not the most important decision. Um, just because it's, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think it's especially close, but it's something that I can see go the other way upon further analysis. Um, but anyway, so this is going to be the bulk of what we're going to move on to. How much, again, we're going to do more things than just this. Um, it's going to probably involve something about Gateway, the Gateway uh, project, Penn Station, how to do better regional rail in New York. Um, so it's so what I think is going to need to happen is for us to actually write down timetables for um, so these are math papers. Job applications and uh, lots and lots of LARP stuff. Like LARP, LARP. LARP that was never completed. Um, you know, I don't need to do the presentation, I can just do it. So this is a map that I specifically drew at lower resolution so that it would not kill the uh, so it would not kill uh, um, the email transfer that I could email the presentation, but I can do it with like a but I mean this is SVG it's, it's vector so I can just take the crayon and paste it on like um, higher resolution open streets map um, so. This is the three line system. So when I say three line, I mean only three lines run through. Um, so this is so the red line, line one is this. Uh, if you're wondering what yellow means, yellow means it's new. So there's a yellow highlight uh, around everything that is new. So gateway is new, so it gets a one sided yellow highlight because the other side is real. Um, so green is line two, and that's everything that's not northeast corridor. Feeding to Gateway, Grand Central, and then these lines. And line three is the LARR. Um, and there's going to be some through service to the Empire connection with more stops than envisioned uh, formally. And I think also Maltalk line can feed there. Um, so, like in the early stage, it's probably going to be something like a train every five minutes to Hempstead. Um, I can see it dropped like a train every time, and then a train every five to East Garden City, which is here. It's the biggest job center. In, like the biggest job centers in Orlando are East Garden City, which is around here, just off the map, and Mineola. And a uh, train every five minutes peak on this line to Babylon. Um, and uh, so, uh, and then the Atlantic branch will just orphan here. Um, so, this is without anything with Lower Manhattan. This is just essentially a gateway plan. Uh, would it be possible to keep the existing alignment through old Lime? Uh, no. Um, so, it's very tight. Um, these are very tight curves. You can replace them with a longer one, but it's still going to be a rather tight curve. So note that you can't even use straight I-95 here. You need to deviate to get sufficient curve radius. So I believe I'm designing everything around four kilometers whenever possible. Four kilometers, what is that? So four 
times the about maximum you can get out of non-tilting German trains is this. So about 330 kilometers an hour, but Japanese trains can do 360. So this is intended to be a curve of radius uh, four kilometers. In fact, it's exactly a curve of radius four kilometers. You can even see how much how it matches because I literally drew this exact circle and then traced over it. Um, remember, this is Greenfield. Um, now let's try to do the same thing with these with the existing things. So first of all, remember that the approaches here are, are gonna suck, but let's hand wave them. If you're to do four kilometers, you wanna be tangent here and here, you need to start. So like if you want a four kilometer easement, it's gonna look like this, roughly. So this is why you can't keep the existing alignment. Like even if you're willing to start taking some compromises, like, like let's do 300 German trains, not 300. Japanese trains. It's okay, 3.3, 3, 3, which is, or uh, like, I think it's 3.320 3, the radius on the current, on the current of Frankfurt line. So, okay. Like, that's not actually going to help very much. As far as easement goes, I mean, it's still, I mean, there's also residential takings here, but not that many. But the point is that it's going to be very difficult to use the existing line. And because you can't really use the existing bridge at high frequency, um, it need, you need to go greenfield anyway. So if you go greenfield, might as well use a better alignment. Does that answer your question? Uh, no. Um, so yeah, it's tight for a new bridge, but I mean, I mean, this is like legitimately zapping parts of the marina, but sometimes you need to like take things. Um, there are very few residential takings, not zero, but very few like these. Um, it's like one, two, three, four, I think six houses seven with this maybe again part of the marina um on this side eight nine this is not a house this looks like a small business these two um and small businesses i mean yeah they can be reactionary but um they sell for you know if they're very successful mid single digit now. Um and the bridge is gonna I mean they probably think it's gonna cost a billion, it's not gonna cost a billion. Like this is a bridge. I mean even if it's a high bridge, it's like what? Like the elevated sign one's gonna be what? This long? Yeah, that's like hundred and fifty million dollars. Two hundred maybe. Yeah no the politics of the stakings are fine. I mean it's again it's seven houses. Like you're gonna get NIMBYs either way. Eventually, NIMBYs are gonna, like, there are NIMBYs in New York, for example, like, people talk about the decline of neighborhood newspapers. New York has neighborhood newspapers. Here's what, here's what the neighborhood newspapers do. They count parking spots lost to any kind of change. This is what they do. You uh, try to build new bus stops, fewer bus stops, whatever. They will say, this will require the loss of 167 parking spots in our community and also create 10 loading zones. Yell at the city. Um, so anyway, these people are always going to be like that. But border society does not gonna, is not going to care about seven houses. Um, they're gonna, I mean, if it's going to be thousands, yeah, people will care. If it's going to be seven in... Uh, seven in uh, Old Saybrook, uh, maybe, like, in Old Lyme, I don't think there's, like, I don't think this involves residential taking. Um, it involves lines that are nearish to the track, so if it's literal, if you, if it's literally this, don't worry, this is like, it's a curve, it's more like this, it's 30-something meters at closest approach, yeah, you trip oblaze the windows and it should be fine. Um, like the the whole point is that the train is not going to actually cross I ninety five. It's going to stay 
um, it, it's going to be a little bit offset north and go on this side of 95. So this is not a residential side of that. Like this is like maybe this is residential, but um, this is right next to I-95. Like that's noisy already. Um, and so it's not, so, so the residential takings are minimal. The complaints from people here are not residential takings. They're about, um, I think, the, I think there were some complaints that the line would pass to, I mean, there were complaints that the line would pass south of I-95 and not north of it. And this would be, I don't think they even complain about these takings. They complain about, um, that it would be audible from city center, from town center here. They complain about the marina, which is the one thing that, has to happen, and they complain that the transition, remember the official plan is not to do this, it's to go on the old line and then, are, and then transition around here, and then they complain that this is environmentally sensitive. Yeah, the neighborhood uh, papers in, in Brooklyn, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, exactly, it's like entirely like, for people who think that the city peaked in 1972 and will not do the city the courtesy of moving to Florida um, and, and, and like leaving it to people who aren't bitter about everything that's happened in the last 50 years. So, um, again, you can ignore them. And you can especially ignore them because it's a national project. Um, it, like, it's a national project in which, like, actual planners can get through to, let's say, members of Congress and explain that, no, they're not going to lose re-election if they piss off 50 people state or 100 people statewide over thinking. It's like, it's really that little. Like, I th like think Darien might be 50-ish, maybe 100. Um, and in Darien, remember, what I think needs to happen is... Um, no, it's not Darien. This is, this is not a taking. This is a... Uh, tunnel. So it's just transport. Darien is this one. Oh, it's Norwalk. Right. Uh, I, I may filter it at this point. Township, like, like my township, towns and not uh, and not counties. So I keep messing this up. But anyway, this is Darien. My crayon through Darien is to do some, is to carve right of way in the east, like in eastern Stanford and through Neurotin. This combined, I think, is 50, maybe 70. So it's 100 if you have pretty generous clearance between the track and residential. This is the most racist suburb in all of Connecticut. The other racist suburbs in Connecticut think that they're racist. Um, if they're pissed, Okay, let them be pissed. Like the other side. I mean, the, like again, these are like these are not people who are actually powerful. These are all people who are like essentially paper tigers. Um, so yeah, just, a lot of it is ignoring NIMBYs, but also a lot of it is doing better um, coordination between commuter rail and um, and high speed rail. It, as I said, will almost certainly require us to write an actual timetable for Gateway. Which is fine. Writing timetables is what I love. Like, I love writing timetables. Um, like, this is finally me doing what I love because I don't actually love chasing Swedes or Americans or anyone by email. Like, I, I love interviewing people, but um, sometimes, like, it gets too annoying. Writing timetables is literally me doing what I love. And this is something that we're going to need to do. And again, as I said, it's fine. I mean, it requires more advanced software than we have, but that's fine. We can get it. Um, I mean, we're probably going to talk to Dutch schedulers about this and Swiss schedulers, but again, that's not 50 interviews. That's fine. Um, so anyway, that's where we're at. That's what we're doing. As I said, it's not just nice speed rail. It's going to be used for adjacent things like um, a better gateway, better IBX. Uh, we might... I want to say better LGA connector, but that's going to be, you know, one article. It's going to be a spending, I don't know, low double-digit number of person hours on this. And the main project is, I don't know, high four figures. If it's two years and it's three of us working full-time, we might get a fourth. Yeah. I mean, 
spills into the five figures. If not, then it's high four. Um, I think I'm going to stop at this point and start taking questions. And the natural boundary of when I'm going to get off is when it's proper sunset. So right now we're in summertime, so it's 7.30 and I uh, still don't need artificial light, which is very much not what happened in even in late February. Uh, so fire away, please. Um, and if people don't have questions, we can wrap up in a couple of minutes and it's going to be an hour and a half of a You know, it does occur to me that uh, I'm using headphones, right? And a microphone. And I don't think at any point has the microphone not worked, which is something that always used to happen when I use the microphone. Will the project ever do an India report? It is not currently planned, but if we, um, but it is something that we would uh, be interested in. Um, like, I started talking about, like, doing the world report with other people, it's just that it's, um, as I said, I mean, we would need to find someone else to write the report, which is fine, I mean, we have a budget to, like, hire someone, it's, but, um, um, but again, it's, it depends on budget availability around other things. Um, in Ellie Finnmarker's report, what surprised me the most? Um, that's a good question. Um, so, in Italy, the white-collar wages are lower than I thought. Um, and Marco explained it, that in, in the way Marco explained it when I said, but, well, actually, look at the wages in, we look at average incomes in Milan, they're not low. And he explained that uh, Milan just has a high concentration of um, not workers. But the post-tax income for starting engineer in Italy, I mean, it starts with a one. I mean, it's a high one, but... It, Starts with a one, uh, with some years of experience, it goes up to two, three is rare. Right. Um, what else in Italy surprised me? I knew about Mani Polita, but I did not realize how many how infrastructure focused Mani Polita had been. Like I actually did not realize how like the entire corruption like in in Italy the Tangentopoli was about infrastructure and how the removal of the Tangentopoli with Mani Polita and the anti-corruption laws led to an infra to not just a reduced cost of infrastructure by a factor of about two, but also to a boom in which the current decade, I think, might be Italy's... Uh, I think this decade, Italy is going to build more subway kilometers than it ever built in a decade before, just because it's much more cost-effective now than it was 40, 50 years ago. So this is Italy. In Turkey, what surprised me? Um, first of all, just seeing how Turkey was so fundamentally Southern European in its approach to many things, um, which I should have known because, to some extent at least, because um, because in Turkey, I, I had to ask Elif to confirm, but it's something that I probably would have guessed, gone to head without knowing. So people in Turkey think that Europe is more modern than Turkey. And in Turkey, people think of Italy as part of European modernity. It's not like in Germany where people think of Italy as a poor place that is only good for making pizza. So um, so, so the part that Italy taught Turkey certain things and then Turkey did its own improvement, that I did not realize. Um, the other thing I did not realize at the start is that Turkey has... a um, infrastructure consensus. Now, it's not an early commitment type problem, which is what, um, with mega projects, which is what happens in France, for example, or in Britain or the US. Of course, the United States does not have general consensus on sustainable infrastructure, but New York absolutely has a, con a consensus about the subway. Um, and it, again, it leads to early commitment, cost overrun. France has the same. Turkey, it's different because the consensus about growth in general, so I don't realize, and it's on the report, but I did not realize how Yambi Turkey is. Um, so I did not realize how deep the construction market is in Turkey. Now, I don't want to say, ah, you should be Yambi because that's going to give you lower costs. I don't want to commit to that. Japan is fairly Yambi and does not have especially low costs. Um, 
France has been on the EMB bench in the last decade, but the uh, infrastructure costs have been rising rather rapidly there, unfortunately. Um, and I don't think it's related. It's just that they kind of... So, so, so they had early commitment problems with the um, with Grand Paris Express, and I'm starting to get suspicions that the French elite is imitating British and American misfeatures just because the French elite associates Britain and America with greater wealth. Are American and Britain wealthier than France? Not really, but their elites are wealthier than the French elites. I mean, same average income, net of vacation days, uh, and higher inequality means higher elite incomes. I don't know it for a fact. I did not ask about like that level of politicization, but um, in context, I think this is what happened in France. Um, in, but in Turkey, the because there's such a deep construction market, um, there's a very large array of construction firms. This is uh, what I did not realize. Um, these construction firms are exporting their expertise already to the rest of Europe. Um, they're working in Germany and Sweden and Poland. Um, it's not something that I realized before. Um, Borders does not answer your question. Awesome. Does anyone else have, or maybe you have, does anyone here, borners or otherwise, have uh, more questions? Asking if Turkish uh, contractors can work can adapt to the Swedish labor market? Yes, they can. Um, they're entering Sweden. Even Chinese ones are entering Sweden successfully. I mean, the, the I don't know what the problems in China are that drive up its costs, but evidently Chinese firms are competing in Sweden. Like Turkey, remember, Turkey is not. Turkey is a poor, rich country. It's not a poor country. The um, the different. I mean, the ability of Turkey to adapt to um, higher to, to like this this gap in wages should be decent. Uh, are, did, did, did I answer your question? Well, I don't know, Sami. I don't know the answer. Um, um, like, I haven't, so, so I have zero confidence in Amtrak, but high speed rail is not being built by Amtrak because technically it's a separate agency which is also incompetent, but they can maybe do an agency that's actually competent. I'm not sure. I, like, I haven't talked to enough people there to see how reformable they are. Um, oh, can Turkey adapt backward like to like poor countries? I don't know. Um, I mean, there are Korean firms working in the Philippines, and the construction costs in the Philippines are high for subways. Oh, I see what you mean. India has its own domestic expertise, like for, for, for subways. Um, it's not very good expertise, but it's expertise. So bear in mind also that with India, um, their elevated costs, yeah, they're high. India, it, it's kind of weird because, like, based on the database, you can see the very large premium for underground construction in India, or, or even or much more so in the Philippines. But, at least in the case of Mumbai, um, the issue is that Line 3 is being built where there's no wide road to build an L over, so that's just in 
more difficult environment. Um, and, and in general, uh, we can look experimentally at the difference between uh, elevated and subway costs and um, in the database in India, and I say in India because um, what country the, sub, the project is in is very important for its costs. In India, I think it's a factor of two and a half, but maybe it's because subways are being built in inherently more difficult locations. Um, and again, L costs in India are bad, but they're not horrible. Whereas, in, for example, Pakistan, or especially in Bangladesh, they're horrible. Um, so about transferring Turkey's expertise to India, yeah, maybe. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with what India's problems are, besides like seeing their cultural current with high-speed rail. Like, what, so, to put it in perspective, well, the most cost-effective stuff that's being built in India is the electrification project, which is being built at the lowest costs that I'm familiar with globally. I am not familiar with what Chinese and Korean costs are for electrification. I have tried to look, I couldn't find anything. But Indian costs for electrification are considerably lower than in Europe, which is completely false for any of the more prestige uh, mega projects using imported consultants and imported uh, expertise. So India can build things by itself. It just needs to stop thinking that everything other countries do is better. Um, and Turkey flying is not going to help India on this. Like Turkey is by Indian standards a very rich country. Um, thank you for, 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 for being here. Thank you for asking questions. Remember, I, my background is math. We judge the success of a seminar talk by how many questions were asked, and especially how many distinct people asked questions. Um, because if people don't ask questions, the assumption is that nobody understood anything. And if nobody understood anything, it's assumed it's because the seminar was poorly delivered. Um, like, pure math has, like, because pure math has such a poor reputation as like a, a this is like a very abstruse, very abstract discipline, uh, it creates a situation in which mathematicians, especially pure mathematicians, are very become very conscious of clarity and how to like explain to the general public. Um, Borners, can you rephrase that? Why do I think Turkey is in the EU? I mean, Turkey is currently not an EU country, unfortunately. Oh, why do I think Turkey should be in the EU? Um, because um, the because first of all, free movement between Turkey and the EU is going to be amazing um, for both sides. It's going to create much deeper links. It's going to be great, much deeper two-way links um, at all levels, uh, as opposed to what's currently happening, where it's all ad hoc and uh, there's random denial of visas uh, by people who just enjoy being mean to other people. Um, uh, it's uh, going to also help tur uh, Turkish institutions because Turkey is a lot like so. It's kind of weird that there are certain things about Turkey that are like the Southern European margin, for example, their infrastructure, but there are many things that are like their Eastern European margin in which Turkey, and I think in this case, Greece might even be in certain ways Eastern European, that it relies on EU norms to reform its institutions. So if you ask Ukraine, so if the, so, so in, in the case of Ukraine, it's very clear that essentially it's facing competing soft power from two locations. The first is Russia and the second is the EU. Very little of the United States, by the way. The United States has a lot of defense uh, soft power, but, um, and, and so, for example, so when I say defense soft power, I don't just mean military. I mean that Ukrainians want their army to look like the American army in many ways. Um, like, a very random thing that they did is that they changed their rank system. Uh, I'm forgetting when, whether it was at Independence or our revolution or something more recent, but they, I think actually after Maidan, they uh, changed the rank system because in uh, Russia, 
for hundreds of years, the ranks have gone Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, Major General, um, and then Lieutenant General. So there's no rank between a Colonel who commands a brigade and um, a Major General who commands a division. And in uh, the NATO standard, there is a rank in between just called Brigadier or Brigadier General. Sometimes the Brigadier is also a commander of a brigade, but in the United States, as in Russia, Colonels command brigades. Anyway, so my point is that, like, Ukraine is also using, like, the United States and NATO is, like, NATO standard for the military, but for domestic stuff, it's EU. Remember, Euromaidan was about a free trade association with the EU, not anything about NATO. Um, and in Turkey, it's the same. In Turkey, like, there's, like, in Turkey, there's no source of soft power like Russia. Like, Erdogan is not trying to make Turkey like Russia. I mean, he wants authoritarian power, but the exact way that it is done in Turkey looks very different to me from the way that it is done in Russia. Um, or even in early Russia, like the, like, Turkey has a deep state, but the Turkish deep state I mean, you can be a well-known regime critic and you will not randomly fall out of the window. Um, whereas in Russia, like, from the start, it was, like, this kind of violence. Um, and can Turkey get rid of Erdogan? I hope so. I mean, the... Uh, can you see how many polling tabs I have open? No, tabs, I mean... Can, so... Um, so it's a two-round system, and this is how it looks right now. So, um, second round, maybe I should be here. So, second round, uh, Imamolu, so Imamolu is ahead by very large margins in most polls. Not all, but most. Um, the other option, Yavash, even more. Uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, Kilic Daro will be less, but I mean... I don't know if the polls will hold. Um, but it's very different from, let's say, Hungary, where it's very close. Um, and Orban's favorite. Um, would I add Israel and Azerbaijan? I don't know. I mean, like, well, also, I did, my first question is why is Azerbaijan of all places? Like, I mean, Azerbaijan is the most totalitarian of the Caucasian of the Caucasian states. Like, Azerbaijan is also the most is I don't say the most. Azerbaijan is NATO allied to some extent. It is very Turkey allied, and um, it, and its conflict with Armenia makes it at this point much more hawkish toward Russia, and supportive of Ukraine than Georgia, where the government is in full appeasement mode. Um, but, like, remember, the EU is not NATO. The EU is much more soft power oriented, and in the EU, I mean, you cannot govern yourself like Azerbaijan does in China. In Israel, sure, I mean, Israel within its internationally recognized boundaries, so, yet the settlement, kindly. Um, and divide your one, but otherwise, I wouldn't even think about it. But yeah, like my point is that Turkey, like so again, so in in Eastern Europe, there again, there are two competing sources of, of soft power, except that like whatever soft power that let's say Ukraine fell toward Russia. I mean, it was basically gone by twenty fourteen in twenty fourteen anyway, but it's gone completely now. So yeah, congratulations, even the even the um, people who think that uh, uh, Zelensky is oppressing Russian speakers in Ukraine support him and oppose Putin, and specifically support what to think of as a Western Isaiah. Um, again, in Turkey it's different because the main counter is a kind of imagined Muslim greatness. It's, it's, it's very Islamist, rather than the, oh, we're the real saviors of Western civilization, like the Third Rome bullshit that uh, Russia has been telling itself for, I don't know. Uh, eight hundred, almost eight hundred years at this point, but in, uh, 
but but again, I, in Turkey, again, it's their choice. I'm optimistic about polls, but um, a lot of opposition people in Turkey don't believe it's possible. Like they've, it's like it's been twenty years. Anyway, did, does that answer your questions about like my form Europa, like playing paradox games in real life, but with soft enough hard power? All the way up to here, 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 here. Also here, if Georgia wants to be. Are there any cities where I think light rail is a good idea? Too many to list. Essentially anywhere that's not good enough for our subway. So, um, I'm forgetting whether Bielefeld has a Stadtbahn or just a light rail system, but, um, you know, places like that, places like that. Remember, I live in Europe, we have a fuck ton of small cities, like, but no, Bratislava. These are like, like Brno and Bratislava are two of the highest model split cities in NLR. They're entirely trans. Um, a lot of Poland, like, the only really large thing in Poland is, is, is Warszawa, like, um, like, there's nothing of critical mass in Zalazia, and the other cities are, I don't know, a million and a half metro tops, like, Krakow's, and again, like, these are cities with a very strong tramway network, like, Krakow, Wuj, Wrocław, um, Tri-Cities, Poznan, um, Like, lot, again, I mean, it's like a very well-suited mold for European urban geography, I think. Just maybe not for a place to scope the size of Berlin, or Frankfurt, or Lyon, or Prague, if that makes sense. Because, yes, you can see the sun setting in the background. Like just through the, uh, just to the extent to which my face is being illuminated by, by the screen. So if there are no more questions, I'm gonna stop. But I'm gonna give people a few more minutes for like a final question or two. Yeah, LA. Okay, it's not true that LA is not investing in their bus system. LA is investing in the bus system all the time. It's just really expensive to run. So, what do you mean investing in the bus system? Like, it's. I mean, I mean investing in the bus system just means hiring more people and hiring more crews and spending more like operating costs. And these are really expensive. Um, what LA is doing about light versus heavy rail is just weird bespoke shit about different line about like different modes and. Like with Sepulveda, they're being, I think, weird about it. Like, like I don't want to compare Los Angeles to, let's say, Krakow. It's also entirely possible that there's more public. Wait, how many? I, I'm nerd sniping myself. Um, Los Angeles light like rail rider, uh, rail rider I think Los Angeles beats Krakow. Um, so, to put things in perspective for you guys, the entire metro rail is 344 a day, so this is 108 a year. Uh, let me actually check the NTD right now. As I said, I'm not nerd sniping myself on this. But, um, so, so here's the question. Where is there more public transport ridership, even with buses. In Krakow, metro population, I believe one and a half million, or Los Angeles. Who's gonna win that fight? Uh, it's telling me that unlinked bus, that unlinked trips is 380.
And I believe the tramway is about 180. 200. But then the bus is out. I don't remember. It's entirely possible that Krakow is more than LA on public transport ridership, and I'm almost certain it's ahead on. Yeah. Oh, you're seeing articles that they're investing in economic growth with racial undertone. Okay, you're uh, Matt. The people that you're seeing this from are called the Bus Riders Union in Los Angeles, and if they all vanished, Los Angeles would incrementally improve. I say incrementally because they are unfortunately not the worst obstacle. Um, here's the reality. The reality is, let me see if I can find this. Uh, the source, Los Angeles. Uh, Rail bus average income. Here. It's seven years old, but it will not have changed much since. So, and I asked the people, okay. So, household income for the average person in the county. 56k. This is again 2015. The numbers have substantially risen since the United States has had a lot of nominal growth in the last in the last seven years. Train 19,000. Bus 15. So yes, people on the train are slightly less desperately poor than people on the bus. Why? Because the bus in LA is so awful, only the desperately poor ride it. The train is bad, so mostly the desperately poor ride it, and then some people who are not quite as desperate. When you invest in the train, as opposed to LA County, cars, I guess, you are not in any way oppressing poor people. That is bullshit. Um, let us also look at the ethnicity. And again, I'm sorry that this is... Uh, um, okay, if I do this and it's going to look... Um, then Oh, wait, they did a replacement. They just shrank the image. And in the old one, it was still sized bigger. Anyway, what is your ethnicity? Yes, the trains are whiter than the bus. 8% of bus riders in LA are white. 13% of train riders are white. Los Angeles... Okay, so first of all, even knowing nothing about Los Angeles, if, it, um, if you're investing in a mode of transport in America that is 13% white, you are not oppressing people of color. Give me a break. Um, in fact, every single non-white group... I think maybe the exception of Native Americans, because there are very few of them in Los Angeles, so I can't see the numbers. Um, had like is like more strongly represented on the train than in Gen Pop. So no, there are no racial undertones to this whatsoever. Los Angeles should stop thinking the bus is like modern transport. Not a, not a, no, it's not not at the scale of Los Angeles. Buses are, work as rail feeders, but the rail needs to exist. So, no, yes, there are people who enjoy suing the government. There are very antisocial people in Los Angeles activism. It's not just transport, it's also housing. Los Angeles is, NIMBY, is the NIMBY capital of the United States. All of California NIMBYism is either the Bay Area or San Diego. Remember, SB, um, SB 50 had more yay than nay votes in Northern California. It lost because of the demographic weight of Los Angeles. So, yes, you're seeing these articles because you're seeing people who enjoy extracting surplus and calling everything racist, including things that are distinctly anti-racist. You will find people who will say that minimum wages hurt the poor. You will find people saying that um, anti-discrimination laws are actually racist. And I don't even mean racists who like call everyone else a real racist. I mean people who are like in theory, committed to anti-racism, not like, you know, anti-affirmative action hacks, who will tell you about actual enforcement of anti-discrimination rules or hate crimes that this is, um, uh, that this is racist. Um, American activism quite often encourages this kind of behavior. And, yeah, I mean, if I'm the federal government, I'm just not investing in LA until it gets, like, a better 
I mean, the, I, I think LA has management at one point understands what's going on, but like certainly the politics of LA is too toxic. I mean, don't invest there. Like, don't invest in transit there. I, I, I wouldn't. Um. So anyway, yeah, that's the problem in LA. No, they're not under investing in the bus system. They're under investing in the rail system and also their their construction costs. Did they X? Yes, I did. Transit costs. And I really need to figure out how to remove the sponsored things from Firefox, which is supposed to be open source, i.e. non-commercial. Purple line, phase three. Let me see if I incorporated the highest construction. Okay, yeah, I did. Cost per kilometer. Yeah, this is LA's problem, not the fact that it spends money on subways, or light rail for that matter. Like, in LA, talking, talking about mode in LA, it's a little bit like, I don't know, asking whether Putin eats, like, enough vegetables and, like, and gets enough flavor and spice in his diet. And for the record, well, when you say br progressive brain poison, it's not quite that. In LA, a lot of the toxicity is not progressive. As I said, the BRU are... Mil uh, are malicious actors. I think they're in addition to being malicious, also malevolent. But there's other stuff at bay. Where, uh, so there's other stuff there which is not necessarily progressive. Sometimes it's the other way around. In Southern Cali so in California, you need a two-thirds majority in a referendum to increase a tax. Um, so in Northern California, it's sufficiently left-wing that you tell people we're leftists, we're progressives, we're liberals, whatever term they use nowadays. And uh, so we should raise tax for sustainability and public transit. So they keep winning referendums based on that. And so they have, they're terrible at implementing projects, but in San Francisco, like, or, or in the East Bay, they often have the right idea of what projects to build. In LA and San Diego, in order to do, to get a two thirds majority in a place where the Democrats win, but not by two thirds, um, they need to bribe every region of the county with its own goodies, and as a result, the LA light rail prioritization is horrific. Um, like they build things to exurbs where they know they're not gonna get the ridership just to get local power brokers to endorse so that they can win an non-ideological election. Um, it's really bad. So it's not, so yes, the VRU are left-wing brain poison. I don't wanna call them progressive brain poison. Um, they are left-wing, they're very disconnected from the national left-wing now. Um, that remember, in America, like at the national level in the United States, you ask what the progressive position is, it's Yimby as hell. Paul Krugman has been Yimby openly for almost 20 years. Um, so, like, that kind of, like, boomer slash axer, um, uh, who, whose idea is, like, what it is to be a left-wing American comes from Krugman, uh, like, such a person would be Yimby. Um, let's see who else writes for the New York Times and is strongly identified with the left. Um, there is, um, so, so, let, let me, let, let me see if I remember it's, uh, so there's Jamel Bowie, of course, who's very insightful. He's incredibly envy. He's, uh, uh, so, because Krugman is kind of, um, yes, Ezra Klein, uh, um, so it doesn't write for the New York Times, but ta Coates. Uh, he has not been as aggressively EMB as Jamel Dewey has, but um, he has, but he, but his story of reparations and the need for reparations is not just about slavery. Like the whole point of ta Coates is that it's not reparations for stuff that happened more than 150 years ago. It's reparations for stuff that happened 50 years ago, like within living memory, and he talks specifically about issues of redlining and um, subsequent post-war NIMBYism. Um, the color of law um, was directly inspired by, by Coates. So, like, these people, so the national um, anti-racists, so these would be people like Jamel Bowie and ta Coates, are Coates, are I mean, I, I, I don't actually know what, if Nicole Hannah-Jones has said anything about this, but the stuff that she says about school segregation, like, so before the 1619 project, so, so nowadays, if you've heard of um, a black American author on the issue of civil rights, you've heard of Jamel Bowie, 
Tanasi Coates, and Nicole Hannah Jones. Nicole Hannah Jones, if you've heard of her today, it's because of the 1619 Project. But before the 1619 Project, if you heard of her, it was probably because of her work on school segregation and school integration. Um, now, you will find horrific n black NIMBYs who think that school integration is racist because it means that you need to go to school with white people to succeed. Um, these are not. This is not the majority opinion within black America. This is not the majority of opinion, uh, opinion within critical race theory academia. This is not the majority opinion within civil rights activism in general, but you can find pockets where that occurs. Nicole Hannah Jones never articulated this minority opinion because she is a fundamentally sane human being who, yeah, who, yes, in the 1619 Project said one thing that's very controversial and I think historians don't accept it, which was that the American Revolution was specifically a slaveholder rebellion against British abolitionism. But, um, I mean, but this is someone who, like, understands modern American racism very well and understands historic American racism well. And, yeah, she's not going to say something as dumb as school integration is racist. Um, so at least on the level of school, I would call her very angry. Um, and, and again, then you have Matt Iglesias, um, who, as a reminder, staffers to Biden read him. Um, then you have, um, like the the rand the the other um, neoliberal pundits like, um, like Noah Smith, very envy, um, and so the like the national progressive mood in the United States is very strongly envy. Nor and I don't even remember seeing a place like the American Prospect write anti envy articles. Um, David Dayan, the editor, is very NIMBY. He's LA, but that's not the focus of what he writes. So he's privately a NIMBY, but he, I don't rem but I don't recall him actually imposing that vision on, um, um, or, or on TAP. Uh, I don't think TAP has written much about this either way. Um, TAP is very protectionist, for example, so its take on transit can be rather meh. But um, the but the takes the, but but again, a national even a place that is explicitly insurgent left on place uh, on things like the um, ID poll about bipartisan infrastructure framework versus build back better. Um, they don't do NIMBY stuff. I mean, yeah, AOC at this point went from like, like AOC who was horrifically NIMBY four years ago has become steadily YIMBYer as her um, support base has become more national. Um, yeah, and Colorado, yeah. And so these are, like, this is the national center and center-left mode in the United States. Like, yes, you can find alt-left pubs that love um, NIMBY rioters, like the ones who threw rocks at the um, deck buses in San Francisco. But who the fuck cares what, what like, magazines that sell guillotine t-shirts, right? Like, so no, it's not progressive brain poison. Like, it's it's like, I don't know, it's like saying that about something that is conservative brain poison when it is the exact opposite of the position of said to and after the Um. And now you can see that the sun has fully set just by background. Yeah, everyone enjoy. Oh, and and uh, and then Cory Booker. Yes, Cory Booker is not very left wing. Cory Booker um, is the one who privatized the, uh, not the but much of the New York school system to Facebook. Um, but again, even people who are a lot to Booker's left are very MB. It's just people who are very localist, thus nationally irrelevant, thus ideologically irrelevant. Or maybe yeah, Nathan Robertson. But again, who cares? I mean, Rando, who like has a magazine funded by parental wealth, not a lot, not very high circulation magazine either. I mean, sure. I mean, I mean that's about as interesting as talking about like, like what luxury cars people in Monaco buy. Like the actually nationally relevant far left, like the Squad, doesn't do that. But anyway, we're straying very off topic, and again, look at the background color. So, um, 
Are there more questions about transit cost monitor? Or related things, like again, our future plans count as on topic. This was half the video. I guess the video before the class. Can I give it like, oh, vertical, um, what do you mean by vertical sprawl? Like, do you mean skyscrapers? Tall buildings with nothing around, like you mean, like when, uh, like when, like a city in Texas has a skyscraper, and then it's like, and the, and the rest of the block is parking. I mean, that's. Not, I mean, if it's a, if it's a building topology that only exists in the United States, it's going to be associated with higher transit costs, but not because of the building topology, but just because it's the United States. Like, um, construction costs in. Yeah, but that no. Canada doesn't, I mean, I don't think that's correct about Canada. I mean, in, at least in Vancouver, it's not. In Vancouver, Van, Vancouverism is not tall buildings with nothing around it. Um, Vancouver is, tall buildings are actually pretty densely spaced. Um, there might be, um, there, there might be setbacks, um, or, or there might be tower in a base style, but it's very not, nothing around it, um, what Vancouver is like. And at this point, there um, construction cost explosion in Vancouver is not about downtown Vancouver. Actually, the Canada line was not terribly expensive. Their construction cost explosion is about a um, is about going underneath Broadway, which has very few high rises um, and is more of what people think of as a traditional main street. Um, again, like essentially anything that correlates with being America will correlate with high cost, but that's America or or Anglosphere in general. Um, so you can say, oh, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore have a lot of skyscrapers and their construction costs are horrifically high. Sure. Shenzhen also has a lot of skyscrapers and its construction costs are average because it's in China. Um, does the construction cost project end with the release of these reports? No. Uh, we will keep maintaining... The, um, we still add stuff to the database. Like we keep like the database is still being maintained, although we haven't done a full overhaul in which every line that uh, is under construction is being checked for currentness of or currency, I guess, of the, uh, of the numbers. Um, we haven't done this, we should, um, but please let us finish the reports first. It's going to take us another month. Uh, um, so no, the construction cost project will continue. Um, we're going to pay people to fill in the data that we lack language coverage of. Um, it does not actually cost a lot of money to pay someone who speaks Russian to look through Russian and Ukrainian media um, for and mine their construction costs. Um, or, or again, Belarusian media, if like Belarusian media wrote a single thing that was even mildly reliable, but they're not. Yeah, oh, suburban interior is very different. Remember, the construction cost explosion in Canada is not suburban. It is the Ontario line. It's city. Plus, stuff like infill stations and the, or the electrification of GO Transit. Like, GO Transit has horrific construction costs, but it has nothing to do with the land use. It has everything to do with the fact that they just don't care. Um, like, this is what's going on in, in, in Toronto. Anyway, are there other are there other questions? Because if not, remember when I, remember when I said it would be an hour and a half? And this is with drop frames. It's not actually going to be two hundred seven. It's two hundred nine.
how it supplements the um oh I don't know. The answer is that I don't know. Okay. Um it's a really good question. I will ask Elif. Um but the answer is that I don't know. Um like I don't know how uh uh shore adjacent the land use in Istanbul is. Like generally ferries work if and only if land use is right next to the shore. So uh, New York and Vancouver are two such examples because uh, in New York, it depends. So Midtown, ferries to Midtown are just a waste of money. But lower Manhattan has skyscrapers reaching the southern tip. And so the Staten Island Ferry is good for this um, because it reaches exactly where the skyscrapers in Manhattan start. And uh, because Staten Island developed around the ferry, St. George is an important center for uh, Staten Island. Um, so the Staten Island ferry actually works, and then when uh, people try to generalize and do other ferries in New York, the ridership is like measured in quantum units. Um, Vancouver, it's essentially the same thing from uh, North Vancouver to downtown Vancouver on Cebus. Um, but this is, again, this is a very special situation, and I would not generalize it again. It might be the case for Istanbul. I know that um, the Asian side has uh, centers that are pretty shore adjacent, but I will ask Elif. Um, thanks for, for asking me, Elif. It's a really good question. Um, and thanks, everyone, for, for watching. And I will upload. If you're seeing this on YouTube, clearly it's already been uploaded. Um, thank you, and I hope to see you um, with another topic next Saturday. Good time,